Hey, hey, Warriors Saints, good morning. God bless and keep all of you. A blessed fourth Sunday of Lent to all of you. My wife gave me the look. You know what I'm talking about, right? The fellas know what I'm talking about. There's a look, and then there's the look. And she had given me the look because we were driving together on a Sunday afternoon, a Sunday evening, to take some of our friends to dinner. They had done a gracious act for us, and we wanted to thank them with dinner. And we'd gotten into it, hence the look, because she said that I didn't tell her about this dinner. I said, I told you, you didn't tell me. I told you, you didn't tell me. And it kept going back and forth. And finally, I just, I'd had enough. I was fed up. I said, look, I told you. I, don't, I can't help it if you didn't write it down, but I told you. And then she said to me words that I will never forget as long as I live. She said to me, that may be what you said, but that's not what I heard. And time, I'm telling you, bros, time stopped, right? Like somewhere in the back, you know, the distant Kenny, Log Kenny Loggins music started to play. It was unbelievable because I thought for the first time, am I the first and only man to ever hear the words spoken that we all know but that we know that they're not going to admit is that they choose not to listen to us, right? And so I said to her, I was like, what, did you just admit that? Did you just admit that you guys don't listen to anything we say? The look. So, all right, so we're going on to dinner. And, and I said, look, we're going to have dinner with our friends. Let's just have a cocktail to thank them to enjoy the evening. It will help us mellow out, you know, like the, the tension that that's could be cut with a knife in the car. And she said to me, she reminded me, I had been sick earlier and I had, was on a mid-cycle of antibiotics. And she said to me, look, you can't drink. The doctor told you if you mix this medicine with alcohol, it's going to make you sick to your stomach. I said, look, it will be fine. We have to thank them. Besides, if I get sick, you'll help me, right? You'll help me, won't you? Of course you'll help me. The look. So we go to dinner, we're sitting at the table, and of course the waitress comes. We're having a fabulous evening. The waitress comes and says, all right, for specials tonight we have oysters. I love oysters. I was like, all right, let's get some oysters. So we order oysters. Oyster after, she looks at me and says, you know, you're making a big mistake because bourbon, oysters, and, and, and uh, antibiotics don't mix. I'm like, it'll be fine. Like you said, if I get sick, you'll help me. So we're eating oysters, eating oysters. And about... I don't know, three quarters of the way through the meal, I'm not feeling so good, right? Like, I'm getting a little sweaty, you know what I mean? Like, you can imagine, I was, my stomach was, was starting to, you know, do what it was going to do. I don't know how I made it through the rest of the meal. However, we got through, paid the bill, we're heading home, and by now, I'm miserable, I'm suffering. Like, I can't even see, like, right, I'm, everything's crazy. I had to give her the keys to drive me home. I'm like, you know when you're driving, you have the dog that hangs his head out the window to get fresh air? I needed air. And she's just shaking her head. And I said, babe, I am suffering. You've got to hurry. And you know what's coming, right? We get home. It's a race. It's absolutely a race. I'm sprinting from the car to the bathroom. And forgive me, I don't mean to talk about gross things in church, but, you know, I run to the bathroom and I, you know, empty the content of my stomach's, stomach into the sink. And I'm miserable. I'm suffering. Like from the very depths of my, my being, I'm suffering. And she comes in and looks at me. She's standing over me as I'm, you know, face down in, in the bathroom. And she looks at me and I reached up to her, you know, like just pleading, babe, please help me. And she said, I said, you know, I told her, I'm like, you said you would help me. And with love, like compassion and love, the greatest of emotion, she looks at me and says, that may be what you said but that's not what I heard. And she walked out of the bathroom, right? <laughs> suffering, it's a real story. We're talking today about suffering. I know we've been in the midst of a, a campaign on the Ten Commandments, but I wanted to change it. I decided to change it because something beautiful and horrible happened to me on Friday, and I want to share it with you. I'm going to do something that I don't usually do, and I'm going to share publicly with all of us some of the things that I heard from our beautiful people. I'm not going to tell you who, and I'll keep everything very sensitive so we don't, you know, um, spill anything of anything that's someone's personal, but it was a hard day. Uh, it was a hard day for me personally, not because I had issues necessarily to deal with, but because you did. And I, I was like just overwhelmed. So this was Friday. It started with, I mean, it was just relentless. It started with, <coughs> excuse me, someone was talking to me and just heavy about a, a, a spouse that was having, uh, that was doing infidelity, right? Like goes with our, our, our discussion last week about adultery. I mean, it was heavy because they were struggling with this infidelity of this person, suffering from it. One and then two 
parents came to me, separately, not the same parents, who were telling me about struggles and suffering that their children were going through. Sickness, you know, emotional, mental, physical suffering that their children were going through. That's a burden in and of itself that's like brutal, right? Then it goes, it even goes further. There was someone who came who was really angry with a mentor, like upset, and maybe not rightfully so, but was really upset, and it was, it was like causing that person, you know, you love your mentors, and they were having a hard time with him. Someone came, this one was rough too, who is grieving for a loved one who is very ill, right? Grieving, feels lost there. And lastly, the worst one, the hardest one, uh, a person in our parish family who is young, married with young children, found, you know, what we think may be some type of a tumor under his eye, you know, under the brain, and is, you know, having surgery today, as a matter of fact, after liturgy. Um, and I thought, like, holy cow. Like, when everyone suffers, I suffer with you because I love you, obviously. And I thought, this world is over, uh, right now, my world was overwhelmed with suffering. And I was thinking about it, I'm like, that's not, that's just five people. What about all the rest of the things that we go through, right? Like all of the rest of the sufferings, you know, like adding to the list. I mean, divorce, not just even marriages, right? But that's a big one. But divorce between relationships, between people is fractured. We have disease that we deal with, our own illnesses, cancer, uh, COVID, all the things that go with that, the suffering that goes there. How many people worry about finances, right? Like that could be a big one. I don't know where I'm going to get the money for my mortgage next month or to put bread on the table. Which leads us to anxiety, depression, drug use, exploding. Even sometimes our children are, are suffering with drugs. There's so much suffering. And I thought, where's the hope, right? It sometimes seems so overwhelming, the suffering, that hope seems lost. But as always, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, kind of like a little tugboat, tapped me back on course. And as I'm reading Holy Scripture, it hit me. What if, and I'm going to say something contra the world, what if suffering is a good thing? What if suffering, that which we are somehow biologically programmed to reject or get rid of, what if it's actually a blessing? What if it's something that we should desire, right? Funny words to say. But in the epistle to the Hebrews, St. Paul tells us that Jesus... He was made for just a little while, lower than the angels, which means he beca- it's, it's talking about his humanity, becoming a human being. He says he was crowned, listen to the words, crowned with honor and glory because of the suffering of his death. So what Paul is telling us that in the death of Christ on the cross and that horrible suffering that the Lord underwent, this is his crowning with glory and honor, power, Right? You're going to see at the end. He goes further in the next verse to tell us that as he, meaning Christ, was wanting to bring other sons to glory, he made the pioneer of our faith, the one who went first, perfect in suffering. You hear it? You see it on your screens? He became perfect through suffering. The word perfect is like the Greek telos, right? Complete, perfect. And so while we are often trying to get rid of suffering and protect ourselves and insulate ourselves from suffering, what Paul is telling us is that it is something not only that we should not reject, but something that, listen to this, that we rejoice in. Now that seems funny. What? We're supposed to be excited about it? St. Paul, what are you talking about? In Romans, he tells us, for suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character, and character leads to hope, right? Right? In the face of a world filled with suffering, hope is probably the greatest gift that is out there. And suffering leads to hope, right? Think about it like this. If you're an athlete or a runner, right? At at the beginning, you can't really run 26 miles. Nobody can just come out of the gate and run 26 miles, a marathon. But after time and hard work and your suffering and all the pain that goes through it, you start to build up a little endurance. And then your muscles get a little character. They're stronger so that when the race comes, you have hope that you're going to be able to finish all 26.2, right? This is, this, this is what Paul is telling us, that our suffering leads us to hope. And listen to this. Hope does not disappoint. What God promises, God will do. Hope in God is not, some people say that hope is, is a, a false strategy. In this particular case, 
It is not. Hope, trusting in God, that his power, which we'll see in our practical points in just one moment, will lead us through this suffering, perhaps using the suffering to make us what we're supposed to be. This is something that does not disappoint. The power of God is wrapped up in that hope. There are things that try to block us, however, from going through our suffering. The big one is fear, right? Like we're afraid. And, and we'll talk about that in a moment as well. Fear is, is a natural thing that happens to a lot of people. But like, how, how am I going to endure this suffering, right? And with the fear goes the idea that it's difficult. How hard is this going to be? I mean, imagine what the Lord was going as he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? Knowing what was coming. How difficult must that have been? And the difficulty is an issue for us because, look, we're Americans. We like comfort, right? Like, I mean, how spongy are your pews? You can't even sit in wooden pews in this church, right? They're nice, cushioned, spongy, right? We like comfort, right? But to suffer and to go through those things, to conquer the fear, to conquer the difficulty and the comfort, we have to put in place a few, a few practical tools. And I'm going to give you three of them today, right? <coughs> Excuse me. The first one, you got to take action, right? Sometimes when fear overwhelms us, they say there are three, or they say that there are two responses to fear, fight or flight. Have you heard that before? But there's actually a third, freeze, fight, flight, or freeze. And many times people in the face of something difficult and suffering, we freeze. I'm saying take action, right? It's okay to be afraid. In fact, if you tell me, Father, I'm never afraid, I don't believe you. Everybody experiences fear. And getting the courage to overcome the fear is not something you are born with. Some people may have more of it than others. But, but courage, courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is doing the right thing in spite of fear, right? Everybody gets afraid at one point or another. And courage is not having none of that fear. Courage is saying, all right, this suffering is upon me. I will fight and grind my way through that. We must first take action, right? We cannot allow whatever suffering we may be enduring to overwhelm us and to numb us. The second practical point, these are all in your head today, is you got to have hope. We talked about it earlier, right? Like, it, it's, our world is seemingly hopeless, and yet Christ is risen, right? We're in Lent for a reason. We spend so much time in Lent in 40 days going towards the Lord's cross and empty tomb for a reason. Think about that. He conquered and crushed death, right? I mean, how worthy is that that we spend 40 days preparing for that, to celebrate that? I mean, Christ tramples down death by death. And if his way, which is the cross, can conquer death, you better believe it can conquer any suffering that you may be facing, right? no matter how difficult it is. And if it does not conquer it in this life, it presents us the opportunity to be conquered in the next life. Do you understand it? That's powerful. That's powerful. That's what our faith is built upon. That leads me to my last point, our third practical point, is that you have to remember the cross. If Christ's cross took him through death into an empty tomb, and it can do the same thing for us as we battle whatever monsters and sufferings we may be battling in our own lives. You better pick that thing up. And you better carry it. Right? That's why we talk at St. George all the time. Anytime, every time, and all the time about living a crucifixional life. Right? That word is not just trite that we made up to sound fancy. It's power. Because in that cross, as, listen, in the church we talk about the cross as a weapon. Right? the weapon of peace that slew the great monster of death. And if the cross can conquer the monster of death, like I said before, you better believe it can also conquer anything that we face. We must therefore be dedicated, I mean wholly and entirely dedicated to living a crucifixional life. I'll end here. And it's not Father Chris saying that to you. Jesus told us this. He said, look, if any man would deny me, this is from Luke, you're going to see, but it's also in Mark and Matthew and John. If you want to be with me, if you want to go where I go, and you want to be exactly what you are supposed to be, which I know we all do, which is why we are here, then you have to deny yourself, pick up your own cross, and follow. Here's the challenge. I cannot spare you from suffering. If I could, I would. If I could wave a magic wand and take your suffering away from you in a heartbeat. If I could carry your suffering for you 
in a heartbeat, I would do that. But you know, as I do, that's not how life works. That no matter what we do, we will face suffering, some expected and anticipated, and some unanticipated. And yet, it is a moment that we rejoice in, as strange as that may seem. Because no matter what I do, as Father Chris and as you individual people, we cannot be like Christ, right? Like I think about that often. I can't walk on water and I can't feed 5,000 people from a few bread and fish and I can't fix someone's withered hand and I can't rise from the dead. But I can suffer like Christ. And in my suffering, if I suffer as he did, carrying my own cross, that as he was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father on the third day, so too might all of us walk in the newness of life. May our great God and Savior Jesus Christ bless and keep all of you.